Usually I give this lecture at the very end of the term because as you may have guessed already, archaeal viruses are something that's very near and dear to me. But because we've switched things around a little bit and we have a guest lecture on our very last day, um, I'll talk about archaeal viruses today. <clears throat> These are a couple of my favorites, the uh, SSV viruses and STIV that we'll spend a little bit more time talking about today. But before we start with that, are there any questions on the pox viruses and or single-stranded DNA viruses lectures? Um, just, yeah, David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the question is, you know, with the so dependoviruses and then the autonomous parvoviruses, um, how the autonomous ones then um, stimulate the stealth cycle. Um, the answer to that is I don't know, but I think it has to do with those NS proteins, the non-structural proteins. Uh, but I'm not completely clear on that. I'm not absolutely certain that it's very well known what it is either. Okay, as far as the, the pox viruses are concerned. So <clears throat> again, the parvoviruses, uh, Gemini viruses, and cruciviruses, uh, this is another major subject of the work that we're doing in our lab right now, is to try and figure out how the heck a single-stranded DNA virus stole an RNA virus capsid protein gene, which is kind of unheard of. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't believe it for a long time until the graduate student who was working on the project finally convinced me that this is really what was going on. Um, and I didn't need any more projects in my lab because most of the stuff we work on is what I'll talk about for the rest of the lecture today. But this was too much fun and interesting not to follow up on and try and get a little bit more idea what was going on there. So yeah, last chance questions for the ginormous, actually we'll talk about bigger ones later, uh, double-stranded DNA viruses or the really, really small ones. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about Mimi viruses, I guess, Monday uh, next week. Sound right? Just two weeks to go in the term? Scary. <clears throat> Archaeal viruses, just as I was putting this lecture together, I thought to myself, hmm, this would also be a really fun lecture to expand into a whole 10 weeks. Maybe I'll get around to doing that at some point when I'm not teaching a whole bunch of other classes as well. So <clears throat> big picture here is that almost all of the archaeal viruses that people have found to date are double-stranded DNA viruses, but they vary in terms of their genome sizes by a pretty wide range, not quite as big as things like pox viruses, but um, pretty <clears throat> large range. Eukaryotic, I say, uri, uri archaeal viruses have a tendency to be bacterial in terms of their genome complement and their morphology. But this might actually be a little bit of an artifact of how these were first found. So the very first archaea to be found were the methanogens. And this was Tom Brock, well, not so much Tom Brock, but uh, Carl Woese and Ralph Wolf, who were working in Indiana, and they found the 16S sequences to be really different. Um, those were the methanogens. And so a lot of the first viruses that people found were the, what people were looking for in terms of virions. So the quote unquote bacterial may be a little bit of an artifact there. The crenarchaeal viruses, these are the ones that I'm particularly excited about because that's what we work on. Uh, they have completely unique morphologies and very unique genomes as well. And we'll spend a while talking about some of these things. And this is just one of the images from Viral Zone that addresses some. And one of the really fun things about these crinarchaeal viruses is we're discovering new ones all the time. So this is always going to be completely out of date. And every time I give this lecture, it's going to be a little bit out of date as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the phage-like viruses of Uriarchaea. Mostly talk about the Fusello viruses, and those of you who are in the mutant viruses from Hell Lab who have taken it in the past, you'll know some of this. Hopefully, you'll learn a few more new things um, when I discuss it today. And if you don't, then it'll be great preparation for your lab presentations, which you'll be doing next week as well. Um, then I will very briefly cover a whole bunch of other different viruses. Um, the Fusello viruses, these are these guys right here. 
um, with their genomes right there. Um, Rudy viruses are rod-shaped viruses that also infect Crenarchaea. Lipotrix viruses are flexible filamentous viruses. Globuloviruses are a lot like what they sound. These are sort of spherical viruses. The ampulla viruses, I showed you an image of these virions earlier on. These are the ones that have these amazing bottle-shaped virions, and we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. The B. cauda viridae, so two-tailed viruses, these also have a really fascinating morphological change to the virions outside the cell, which is pretty unprecedented. And then I wanted to spend a little while not so much talking about the turivirus structure, but something about what was discovered in terms of how turiviruses get outside of cells. Um, there's something called a virion-associated pyramid, which is a structure that forms on the outside of cells that are virus-infected that opens up and the virions come out of the cells. It's a really brand new way that viruses then can get out, I should say the virions can get out of infected cells. And strangely enough, Rudy viruses, these rod-shaped viruses, that these virion structures are completely different. Each of these has a protein in its genome, which is just homologous in that one protein, and it turns both of these make these virus-associated, virion-associated pyramid structures, I should say. Now, <clears throat> I'm really excited about these archaeal viruses, but the virus sphere says, oh, they're all just here, they're really pretty boring, they're a very small proportion of the whole virus sphere, and hopefully I will convince you here that that's um, not so much of a <clears throat> a point to think about. So um, why viruses of archaea? Well, we've spent sort of the first part of the course talking about viruses of bacteria, um, and then talking about viruses of eukarya, but there's also this whole branch of life here, which until it's actually, well, there were a few viruses that were found before archaea were, <coughs> excuse me, called archaea. But the vast majority of this work has been done in the last 20 years or so. Um, in fact, a lot of the time since I've been working on them. Uh, why should we be studying archaea in the first place? Uh, they're everywhere. They're not just in extreme environments. People thought that they were only in extreme environments, but it turns out that they're everywhere in soils, actually probably even in our own microbiome. You have archaea, certainly on the skin and in the oral cavity, there's lots of archaea. They are very similar to eukaryotes in their basic molecular biology, transcription, replication. Some people say that we are basically derivatives of archaea, so eukarya evolved from archaea. That's a highly controversial subject right now. The reason I got interested in archaea is because some of them do thrive in extreme environments, like boiling acid, and I'll show you some pictures of some of the boiling acid a little bit later on. Everything that I'd learned about biology said boiling acid is not good for life, but they're full of these <clears throat> organisms. Some really fascinating ether lipids that we'll get back to a little bit later on. So this is one of the things that makes archaea really different from both bacteria and eukarya, is they have these really unique lipids. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about some of the structures. Um, a little bit later on. And the reason they're called archaea, old, is they may be similar to ancestral organisms. And if you look at one of these 16S small subunit RNA trees, the archaea are branching pretty close to a last potential common ancestor. Again, you can argue about these trees. Lots of people do. I'm not going to get into any of those arguments. So archaea just fundamentally are very interesting organisms. And one way to learn about organisms, as we've heard about through all the viruses we've talked about so far this term, is to study the viruses that infect them. And this was actually one of the first big surprises when people started to seriously study the viruses that were infecting these archaea, is that a lot of the morphologies were just really, really different to the virions. Uh, you did have a few that looked pretty standard. And again, I think a lot of this is historical because that's what people were looking for in electron microscopes. They said, okay, if for a long time people thought archaea and bacteria, they're prokaryotes, um, they're going to have the similar kinds of viruses, so you're looking for these head and tail um, like morphologies. But as soon as people started to focus a little bit more on studying these virions, and particularly 
the virions that infect the hyperthermophilic acidophiles. They found a lot of viruses that look like this, SSV1, that we'll spend quite a long time talking about. Uh, these long filamentous viruses with tiny claws at one end, some spherical viruses, this one again, the amazing bottle-shaped virus, and then this icosahedrally symmetric one, which actually was the first of the icosahedrally symmetric viruses to be found in Archaea at all, which again, you know, I was the one to discover in the first place. So people used to think, again, that the viruses that were infecting the Uri Archaea, and sorry, I should have um, emphasize this, so we can back up here a little bit to the tree. If you look at the archaea, they're really divided into two major groups, or at least they were at this point, which is a little older. Um, the, it's a little hard to see here, but Kren archaea is this group here, including Sulfolobus, and the Uri archaea are those over here, which it contains the methanogens and the extreme halophiles. And this, for a long time, was the only kind of groupings that you had in Archaea, Kren Archaea, Uri Archaea. And still, to this date, these are the main groups which can actually be cultivated. And cultivation, of course, means you can study them, you can study their viruses reasonably well. So there's Sulfolobus and where we are. Uh, <clears throat> so the Uri Archaea, people actually knew about, again, before they even knew that they were Archaea. And these are two viruses that were found the virions of viruses that were found very early on. Siam-1, which infects methanogens, classic head and tail-like bacteriophage. Um, and the genes in this genome actually look a little bit like some bacteriophage as well. Phi H1, um, this infects the extremely halophilic archaea, really confusingly originally called halobacterium, which gives you an idea what people thought about bacteria versus archaea. Um, these guys have also typical bacteriophage structure and a genome which is actually not at all unlike the, the genome of Lambda, also integrates into genomes and has a number of similar genes, tail fiber proteins, etc. But after people, sorry, had looked at some of the Krenarchaeal viruses, what they noticed was there are also some very strange other kinds of structures, and after, again, people had studied the Krenarchaeal virus and said, oh, these are really bizarre virions, we'll go back and look at some of our cultures of the extreme halophiles and some of these other archaea, and they found some particles that looked actually more like some of the Krenarchaeal viruses. This is HIS-1, um, Haloarchula Halo hispanica virus 1, um, a 3D reconstruction, and actually I've printed that one up here probably looks a lot like the SSV that I've been throwing around before because it actually does have a very similar structure to the SSV. One question that immediately comes up here is, oh, hmm, maybe the spindle shape is something that's specific to archaea rather than the high temperature, low pH environments that you find these things in. Um, people have also found some of these spherical viruses, and this is <clears throat> the spherical halo virus. If you get a higher resolution structure of this, it actually turns out to look a lot like STIV. And so there are some other potentially conserved structures that you see there. And then if you think at the very high temperature environments, there's this sort of spindle shaped, and I should say this is a virus-like particle. So one of the things that people did, again, originally you study viruses, you look for plaques, you find things that look like viruses that you expect. But you can also go into environmental samples and purify all those little tiny dots that we talked about way back when, lecture one. Uh, each of those little tiny dots represents a virion. And then if you look at those in the electron microscope, then you can see things that look like this. Um, again, lots and lots of these lemon-shaped or fusello particle-like viruses. So these are the uriarchaeotes. What about the crenarchaeotes? Where do you find them? Um, you use a long pole to collect the samples. Um, this particular one is, this hot spring I should say, is in Yellowstone National Park, 85 degrees Celsius, pH of about 3.5, and this is how much gray hair I had in 2000. Um, but this particular hot spring really does look like tomato soup. I've never found a projector that actually can really do justice to it. Um, it's a much brighter red color than this. Um, we did find some sulfolobus in this particular spring. Again, not quite boiling, 85 degrees Celsius, and only pH 
but really classic kind of sulfalobus-like environment. So this is the beginnings of looking for these crenarchale viruses. How do we find them? Basically, we take a sample, again, at the end of a long pole, um, and then we take this, we bring it back to the lab, we grow it in the lab, and then we just look to see if there's anything in that sample that we've grown that makes the organisms that we're testing, which is sulfaloba, sick. And then we'll look in the electron microscope and see what kinds of particles that we can find there. And those people in the lab know that, that you know, seeing if there's something that makes the sulfaloba sick is literally just by putting a little spot on a lawn and seeing if it forms something that looks a little bit like plaques. You ready for a clicker question? Enough of us have got here already? Hopefully everyone's going to get 100% on these ones today. That's my plan. So, <clears throat> virions of viruses which infect which of the following have the most morphological diversity? Uriarchaea, Crenarchaea, E. coli, primates, or amoeba? We'll stop there. You guys can talk about this again. I'll answer the question really briefly. <laughs> so quickly discuss amongst yourselves what you think the answer should be, because we didn't get 100%. Uh, and <clears throat> the answer to the question here is what about going from lake to lake and looking at different samples? We'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> we'll get back to it. The shorter answer is we don't know, <laughs> but the long answer is they may be getting from one spring to the other. So, potentially encoding in silica. In silica, so becoming mineralized. And that we're not going to talk about here, but I can give you more information about it later. <laughs> so, paper we published in 2013. Okay, everyone's decided. Okay, let's go do this again. <clears throat> Have more than twenty three people here today. Looks like everybody's voted already. Four, three, two, one. We have one person who thinks it's Yuri Archaea. I'm not quite sure who that person is, and I'm rather happy to talk to you about it later. But no, the correct answer is Crenarchaea um, and you know, E. coli, primates, and amoeba, really boring in terms of their morphological diversity. <clears throat> So speaking of morphological diversity, let's spend a couple minutes talking about the Fusella viruses. Again, hopefully those of you who are in the viruses in Hell Lab will learn a little bit in this process. This 
is the an electron micrograph of multiple virions of SSD1, Sulfolobus spindle shaped virus 1. They have these really pretty unique morphology, about 60 nanometers across by 90 nanometers in length, with a short tail structure at one end. Neither icosahedral symmetry nor obvious helical symmetry. We'll get back to that a little bit later on. The genome is a double-stranded circular DNA, but it's positively supercoiled. And we talked a little bit about this in molecular biology last term. Positively supercoiled means overwound DNA. And basically what that does is it compacts your DNA, just like negative supercoiling would do, but it also makes it harder to pull the two strands apart because it's now overwound. And this makes perfect sense in extreme environments, particularly very high temperature environments, because it's going to take more energy to pull those two strands apart. So positive supercoiling associated with these high temperature microbes. And it turns out people found plasmids later um, after this that also have stably positively supercoiled DNA. But this, to my knowledge, was actually the first example of stably positively supercoiled DNA to ever be found was in just purifying DNA from these particles and finding them therein. The genome itself integrates specifically into a tRNA gene in the host sulfolobus genome through an integrase gene, which actually is quite similar to the lambda integrase gene in terms of its overall structure, structure excuse me, and function. Also very like lambda, the production of virions is inducible by UV irradiation. So at the DNA damage in lambda, you, that gets detected, rec A, C1, et cetera, gives you induction. How induction in SSV1 works, we don't know. But it does, and we've got some ideas on how that could work. And as I heard, overheard, I think, David talking about a little bit earlier, um, this particular virus was isolated from a hot spring in Beppu, Japan. Um, and the host that it was found in is called Sulfolobus chibatai. <clears throat> when I first actually started working on this virus a little over 20 years ago, I guess I'm almost legal to work on this virus now. I think I started in 96, so yeah, been legal for a couple of years now. We knew actually very, very little about the virus genome. So it's not just the morphology of the virion, but also the virus genome, which is really very unknown. I mentioned this integrase gene already. This is like the lambda integrase, takes the viral genome, inserts it into the host genome. And then if you purify particles, and again, this is before I started working on this, purify virions, you find these three proteins, VP1, VP3, and VP2. VP2 seems to be a DNA binding protein, presumably involved in genome packaging. And VP1 and VP3 seem to make up the majority of this capsid structure. Otherwise, we were actually pretty clueless about what the rest of the genes were doing. And this is when I started working on this particular project. And there are really two ways that you can try and figure out how these genes work, or more than two ways, but two pretty straightforward ways, both of which I started working on. The first one is actually the fun way um, to try and figure out what these genes are. And that is to go to hot springs throughout the world and collect samples at the ends of long poles and bring them back to the lab and see if you can find something that's growing in those samples that will slow down the growth of sulfolobus. This is <clears throat> Wolfram Zillig, who is my postdoctoral advisor and really the pioneer in the study of these archaeal viruses, um, together with David Prangishvili, who I'll also point out at the end of the talk if we get there time-wise, um, and Ingelor Holtz, um, who really ran the whole lab when I was there and kept him in line. Uh, this is where sampling in Iceland in 1995. I think I know where this is. I'm not absolutely certain because I wasn't on this trip. I was actually very fortunate to go to Kamchatka in very far eastern Russia, collect some samples there from some of the hot springs in a place called the Valley of the Geysers. Uh, this is a place, a hot thermal area, where there are as many geysers there in Yellowstone that was discovered by non-natives in the mid-1940s. Gives you an idea of how isolated it is. There are about 10 times as many bear as there are people on the Kamchatka Peninsula, and the only way to get here is via helicopter. Oh, pardon me. Um, also, this is Yellowstone National Park, 
Um, this is a very beautiful hot spring. Unfortunately, it's too cold for Sulfalobus. It's only 60 degrees Celsius, but it's rather photogenic. Um, quite near here, we found some other hot springs that were high enough temperature and low enough pH. And this guy um, right here is Blake Wiedenheft, who is one of the so-called unsung heroes of CRISPR. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9, he was very involved in some of the structures of some of the CRISPR-Cas9 structures after he you know, saw the error of his ways and escaped from working on <clears throat> these kinds of viruses. So myself and a number of other researchers have gone to hot springs in Iceland, in Kamchatka, that original one that I told you about from Japan, at our favorite hunting ground now in Lassen Volcanic National Park. And we have taken samples, brought them back to the lab, seen that they have something which is slowing down growth, looked under the microscope, saw that they had these lemon-shaped virions in them, and then sequenced their genomes. And the reason that we're sequencing the genomes, we're just trying to find genes that are shared between all of these different viruses. So they're probably going to be important for function. And then genes which are not shared, which are probably less likely to be important for function. Because again, we have no idea what these other genes are doing. So to make a long story short, and this is published in 2017. Um, many of you, again, in the lab will have read this paper. Um, here we have the SSV1 genome on the outside, um, 35 open reading frames, each of these represented by these block arrows. <clears throat> and then conservation. If these genes are present in all 11 of the SSVs that we looked at. They're listed here in black, um, including the viral integrase gene. And if they're only present in SSV1, they're in gray. And one thing that should be pretty obvious is about half of the genome here is mostly black with a little bit of orange, and then this one little blue outlier here, and this gray one here, although I'm not sure if the annotation is correct for this one. So it looks about half the genome is really well conserved. The other half of the genome is really not very well conserved at all. And this is strange. Now, generally, now I say these are you know, similar viruses. We're calling them all SSVs, SSV1 through SSV10. In most of the other viruses we've talked about this term, this would be a whole new virus family. Just the differences if you've got 50% of the genome as being completely different. So these are way more diverse than, say, the papillomaviruses that we've talked about, or the polyomaviruses relative to each other. They just don't have all of these you know, extra genes down here, which are really unique to individual viruses. So this is really nice evidence that in a native environment, i.e. at one of the hot springs, these black genes are the ones that are important, and these gray ones are much less so. But that's a really indirect way of looking at this. So what else have we done? We've done a genetic approach. And this is something that I set up originally when I first started working on these in the late 1990s. And we've continued to work on this. And in fact, the Mutant Viruses of Hell Lab is working on this as well, where we did both directed and random mutagenesis of the SSV1 genome. So the directed mutagenesis, these are the open reading frames that are shown here in green and in red. We did deletions of these genes. Um, this one here, you can delete it, and the virus is perfectly infectious. If we delete this gene, it's non-infectious. Then we also did insertional mutagenesis. We actually didn't know where we did these insertions. They should be random. Whether they are or not is an open question. Um, anything that's green is then functional when you make an insertion there, and red is non-functional when you make an insertion there. And if you squint your eyes a lot and look at this, about half the genome up here is red, or has red arrows associated with it. And about half the genome down here is green, or has green arrows associated with it. Now, there are definitely exceptions to this as well. For instance, down here, we've got some red open reading frames and red insertions, but we can delete and can't get an insertion there. Um, interesting differences there. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is actually right up here. Um, Mentioned the viral integrase gene. I haven't labeled it here. This is the viral integrase gene. Here, looks as if we can't get rid of it. These are the virus structural proteins, uh, VP1, VP3, and VP2. VP3 is thought to be something which is really important for 
virus function, at least in the native environment. It's completely conserved. Every single SSV genome that we found has that gene in it. But here, we can get rid of it. And it still seems to be functional. So this was a real puzzle, and we spent quite a long time, when I say we, um, mostly Eric Iverson and Madeline Gorschels, who were working in my lab at the time. And what we found was that, actually, if you get rid of this VP3 gene, it's a little hard to tell here, but the normal, nice, happy SSV1 has this lemon shape. And if you get rid of VP3, these start to be much more cigar-shaped, and actually much more variable in terms of their shapes. Here, the shapes are really pretty consistent. We've got a couple of weird ones. There's this guy here and this guy here. Whereas when we delete VP3, lots and lots of more cigar-shaped particles, and we've done some of the statistics. Again, they're in the paper. We see that getting rid of that VP3 gene causes the virus to be differently shaped, but still functional. So we think that this VP3 protein is very important for maintaining the nice lemon-shaped structure in a normal case and probably really important in the environment as well. Uh, just again, because of that conservation that we see in samples that we find from out the world, but in the lab we can get rid of it. This is a bit of an overview of this. Um, very surprising is that we noticed only about half of the genome is completely conserved, the other half is not, and again, this in most cases, for when most people talk about viruses, this would make them all completely different families, rather than being very similar. Our genetic approach showed that about half the genes are essential. I didn't count them and go through them, but the um, take-home message of our paper was about half of the genes are non-essential. This is also really weird. Most viruses, when you knock out half of their genes, the virus is no longer functional. But in this case, the virus seems to be able to survive in the lab environment, infecting the one host that we're looking at. And then, finally, this uh, mutation in a completely conserved gene still is functional, but it makes these aberrant virions. And this is another example of some of those aberrant virions here, and very much elongated in terms of their structures um, relative to the wild type down here at the bottom. One of the things that we've done with this virus particle, working in collaboration with Mark Murray at the UT Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, we've done cryo-EM reconstructions. This is not a very high resolution structure. It's only about, <clears throat> excuse me, 32 angstroms, about 10 times better resolution, would be about 3.2. So we actually start to see some of the individual molecules and proteins in here. We can't do that right now. All we can see is the overall structure. <clears throat> This overall structure um, has this beautiful tail here at the end of the genome. No, it's not colored. It's just shown colored here just to offset it nicely. This has nice six-fold symmetry. Um, where did I put my bacteriophage T4? <clears throat> if you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, bacterial tail structures, those also have six-fold symmetry at the ends of their tails. And so this six-fold symmetry seems to be something very common in bacterial viruses associating with hosts. And the other thing, which I didn't tell you about sulfalobus, sulfalobus has a cross-linked glycoprotein outside layer on the cell. It's called the S layer, which is hexagonal. So hexagonal, six-fold symmetry. Should sound really familiar. We think that this tail structure is associating with the S layer in terms of being able to infect the cells. We have no direct evidence for this, all of it's circumstantial, but you've got six-fold symmetry here and six-fold symmetry on your host, it seems pretty likely that these are going to be interacting with each other. So that was the part that got me really excited about this structure. My colleagues in Texas uh, got much more interested in what's going on with this part of the structure, because this, this doesn't look like an icosahedron, it doesn't look like helical symmetry. How could you describe this in terms of a regular virus structure? I told you it's mostly made of VP1 and VP3, so just two proteins. Usually if you've got one or two proteins, you're going to have this icosahedrally symmetric structure where you've got pentagons and hexagons. And so they thought more about this, way more than I did, and they came up with this idea of what's called a fused fullerene cone. And basically what this is, 
is it looks like an icosahedron at this end for half of it. It looks like an icosahedron at this end, and you can see here the pentamers and hexamers, but basically stretched out and blown up. So you end up with 12 pentamers, shown here in green, spread around either the top and bottom or middle, and that could give you a structure that, again, if you squint at it, it kind of looks like this structure. Now, why were they so excited about that? They're very excited about that because it turns out that the HIV-1 oops, capsid structure, ah, uh, where we go here, <clears throat> has a similar kind of fullerene cone structure where you have the pentamers, also shown here in green, enclosing the HIV-1 genome, and as we'll see on Friday, also the reverse transcriptase and various other enzymes um, that are packaged inside this genome. So our thought, and again, our thought here mostly being my collaborators, is that this structure um, has some overall just architectural similarity between HIV-1 and SSV-1. And we mentioned this really briefly in our paper, and then the news media got a hold of this and said, oh, look at this cool structure. It's going to tell us how to solve HIV-1 and develop all kinds of HIV-1 medicines. Well, no, not really. But um, the, the idea here is that you don't just have icosahedrally symmetric structures. You can have these tweaked icosahedra, as I like to call them, which would also potentially give you a structure that looks like this. So another kind of structural paradigm. We've got icosahedra, we have helices, or maybe you have these fullerene cones as another way to put virions together. Again, this is, I guess we need to have higher resolution structures um, of these particular virions, and we're trying to do that right now. Even though it's taking us a while, this was in 2014, and we're still working on it. In fact, um, Nicole, who some of you know, is going to be sending some particles to our collaborators in Texas, hopefully this afternoon, so we can get some better structures here. So to finish up on the Fizella viruses, um, these have, again, about half of their genes are not required. We find them all throughout the world. Getting back to Gareth's question, how do they get there? Um, great question, because all these hot springs are separated from each other. But where do you find these hot spring environments? Near volcanoes. What do volcanoes do? They erupt and then potentially spread these viruses across the world. And one of the things that you find is that those <coughs> genomes, again, only half of them are conserved, means that they probably only get, get from one spring to another on a relatively rare basis. And they've been able to evolve in those conditions. Um, the structure is really quite malleable. When I say this, that's when you change that VP3, it ends up with much more of a cigar shape. Um, and then we also have these viral integrase genes. Ready to answer a question on Fusella viruses that everyone's going to answer correctly? Yes? Okay, let's do this. According to Stedman and coworkers, 2014, uh, the structural architecture of SV1 is most similar to that of bacteriophage MS2, bacteriophage T7, Mimi virus, HIV1 capsid, or SV40. And we'll let 23 people vote, and if we're at 100%, then I'll just stop it. more click. <laughs> we want to go over the whole minute. Everyone needs a break. Ten. Five. Someone's out here to just make, oh, hang on, let me uh, actually show you the results. Uh, <clears throat> someone's out here to mess up my 100%, I can tell. I could go and look and find out who you are, but I won't do that. 
Okay, so now I want to just zoom through, as if I don't zoom through this fast enough already, uh, a few of the other viruses that are Krenarchaeal and have some really fascinating aspects about them. The first of those I wanted to talk about was the Lipothrix viruses. These are incredibly long virions. I didn't sort of mention this before, but this scale bar here is 100 nanometers. The diameter of the sulfolobus, or in this case, um, yeah, this one's sulfolobus, um, that gets infected by these cells is only about a micron in diameter. So the actual cell here that each of these virions infects is only about half as large in diameter as these guys are in length. So the virion is twice as long as the diameter of the cell, which is really just crazy. And how that works, we really don't know. These virions also have some fascinating structures at their termini. These tiny little claw structures, again, this is 100 nanometers. Um, and these actually close on pili. So when they interact with pili, they close on the pili, and presumably that's the way that they're getting inside the cell. Their genomes are also double-stranded DNA with covalently closed ends. So they're actually really similar to the pox viruses. Remember those uh, <coughs> loops that happen at the end of the pox virus genomes? So those are connected to each other. And that gives you a potentially interesting structure at their ends. Um, these guys also have inverted terminal repeats and lots of repeated sequences. I forget what they are, but they're a six nucleotide sequence, which is repeats many, many times. So it kind of also looks like a telomere in terms of maintaining the ends of the genomes. There's nothing that looks like a telomerase in any of these genomes, but they have this strange repeated structure at the ends of their genomes. The virion that you know, I like the most is these Acidionis bottle-shaped virus genomes. These have, <clears throat> they're pretty large. They're about 230 nanometers in length. And so just for comparison purposes, the SSV here is about 90 nanometers. So these bottle shapes would be about twice this long. Middle East is a million times life size. Uh, but they're really very, very large as far as virions are concerned. They have this pointed end, which is presumably the end which is attaching to the receptor, and then these 20 filaments um, at a circle at the base. And I kind of like to think of these as like birthday candles with my daughter's 12th birthday over the weekend, uh, but not, you know, not 20. But around the outside, now how you make a structure like this um, in terms of assembly. Now, this doesn't look at all like a helical structure or a icosahedral structure. How something like this gets assembled is really, I think, a very open question. The genomes are also quite different. Um, turns out that these genomes have a protein-primed DNA replication, so not unlike adenoviruses and the polioviruses in terms of protein-primed genome replication. So that's the Acidionis bottle-shaped virus. There also are spherical-like viruses. These are curious not so much because of their virion morphology, but much more because of their genomes. Almost all of the open reading frames are just on one strand, so it looks like they're being transcribed from just one promoter. Um, also have inverted terminal repeat sequences, also linear double-stranded DNA. The Acidionis two-tailed virus should sound relatively familiar, at least in looking at their structures, because if you just look at virions that are being produced, they look a lot like SSVs. But what's really bizarre is if you take these virions and just incubate them at 70 degrees Celsius, what happens is they grow tails at either end of the virion. Now, these are pure virions. They're on the outside of a cell. You know, virions aren't supposed to change shape when they're not associated with the cell. But these do, and this process, you can't really tell here so well, 
but it turns out it maintains the volume of the virion. What happens is this central piece basically squishes and in the process grows these two tails, and this is the two-tailed virus or the B. cauda viridae, um, and this form of the virion is infectious, this form of the virion is not. And this may be getting back to Jared's question about earlier about how these things get from one place to another, is that this seems to be sort of a dormant form, and so if you have production of virions in one condition, and potentially low temperature, it splashes out of the hot spring, for instance. This is non-infectious, but also stable, but only once it gets into the appropriate conditions where there are likely to be hosts around, then it changes its morphology so that it's now infectious. And so, again, this is a different way of doing the whole metastable state that you have for virions. Here, very stable when it's being produced, not terribly stable over here, but able to infect. So this is a, yeah, down? So do I have an idea how this could be happening? The answer is I have absolutely no clue. But the Prangishvili lab who's been working on this, what they think is they've actually identified the protein, which seems to be involved in making these tail structures, and it seems to have two different structures. So it's got a structure here in the lemon-shaped virion, and then a conformational change happens in that protein, which allows it to polymerize and basically push the two ends away. So that's what seems to be happening. It's got two different forms, two different structures of this particular protein. And they're looking into trying to figure out what those structures are not quite there yet, um, but it's, uh, I'm just waiting for them to come up with another paper where they can talk about some of these structures. I mentioned that we have mostly double-stranded DNA viruses that are infecting these extremophiles. Of course, that's until people start looking in more detail. This is now a single-stranded DNA virus genome. It's the largest single-stranded DNA virus genome found to date. It's got 24,000 nucleotides almost 25,000 nucleotides in length. Um, that you have a single-stranded DNA genome that's this big is really bizarre. Um, forms these also interesting virions, which are kind of coil-like here at the bottom. That's why it's called coil-shaped virus. Um, short projection at this end, and then a coil that goes around and around and around, presumably packaging this single-stranded DNA virus um, ending up with another projection at the very far end here. This guy doesn't infect Sulfalobus. It infects an even more thermophilic <laughs> organism called Aeropyrum pernix that grows optimally at 90 degrees Celsius. And this is kind of the opposite of what you would expect. You think about single strands, those are going to be less stable. Well, but this one is working and it's functioning at these really, really extreme temperatures. So we don't know much more about the structure of this one than just, again, what you can see here in the negative stain electron microscopy. But we have learned, literally in the last couple of years, a lot more about some of the other viruses um, that are infecting Sulfalobus. These are the so-called Rudy viruses, also very long structures. Um, this one is almost as long as the cell that it infects. Um, Sulfalobus is lined because rod-shaped virus. These are double-stranded DNA viruses. There's a whole family of these. Um, I think we're up to SSV, uh, SIRV, excuse me, nine or ten now. They have slightly different length genomes. And one of the things which is really interesting is the virions actually vary in length relative to the length of the genome. So if you've got a longer genome, you have a longer virion. You have a shorter genome, you have a shorter um, virion which is actually exactly the, like what you see in some of the rod-shaped viruses like tobacco mosaic virus, for instance. If you insert extra genes in tobacco mosaic virus, the virion gets a little bit longer. However, unlike tobacco mosaic virus, these are now double-stranded DNA viruses. They have closed hairpin ends, again, just like what you see in the pox viruses. Um, long inverted terminal repeat sequences probably replicate like pox viruses, 
These guys, however, have extremely high mutation rates, and why that is is also not entirely clear. There's not an obvious DNA polymerase. There's nothing about the structures that mean that it should have a very high mutation rate, but they do seem to. Um, and they have these, these tail fibers that stick out at one end and probably are what's important for interacting with receptors. This helical structure is actually really pretty nice because you can use helical structures just like you can use icosahedral structures for doing reconstructions. And there's a group um, at, I think, University of Virginia, if I remember correctly, um, Engelhardt's group, who just gotten really good at using helical symmetric structures and getting high resolution structures from them. So what they've done in the last couple of years has been to study a lot of these hyperthermophilic Krenarchaeal viruses using helical symmetry, and they've ended up getting close to X-ray crystallographic kinds of resolutions. And now four angstrom reconstruction of the SIRV2 genome. And what it is is a helical, helically packed proteins. And this is going to be a little hard to see here, but each of these different colors, we got green and yellow and red. Each of these are now helical structures, and we'll see the structure a little bit later on, that are basically wrapping around and then stacking on top of each other to make these helical symmetric structures. So that's what proteins look like. When they saw this structure, it was actually really fascinating because you could also, it was high enough resolution to see the DNA as well packaged inside that structure. And their surprise was, is it's A-form DNA that's packaged inside the structure, not B-form DNA. So differences between A and B-form DNA, the main thing is you have a much larger, so a wider anyway, major groove and a narrow and deep minor groove, and the base pairs are not stacked on top of each other like you have in B-form DNA. They're really twisted relative to B-form DNA. And this also probably has to do with stability. It's not entirely clear why A-form DNA should be more stable than B-form DNA, but again, these are viruses that are infecting these hyperthermophilic archaea optimally growing at 80 degrees Celsius. So it's probably something about A-form DNA that allows it to be more stable under these extreme conditions. So we've got A-form DNA, we've got positively supercoiled DNA. <coughs> what about some of the other structures? This is um, Aeropyrum pernix, again, that 90 degrees Celsius hyperthermophilic archaea. This is a very small genome, only five and a half thousand base pairs. Um, Bacilliform is rod-like. These are actually really quite short. It's only about 300 angstroms in length. Um, again, these alpha helices that are packed into a helical structure that then packages the genome. And then these end cap structures, which might actually be more like the structure that we have in SSV1 than the HIV-like structure. This was published in 2017. Our structure came out in 2014, beginning of 2015. So maybe these structures are more likely to be what we have in SSV um, rather than the HIV-like structure. The last structure I wanted to talk about is one of these filamentous viruses. I'm sure those are the ones that are you know, twice as long as the cells that they're infecting. Um, may or may not remember, I call them lipotrix virus. Why lipo? Lipo because they have lipids associated with them. And so this is, again, also from the Angerkart group, together with David Prangishvili, this is a helical reconstruction of these viruses. So you can actually see this lipid around the outside that's enveloping a <clears throat> capsid on the inside with helical symmetry, again, very similar in terms of its structure to the SIRV structure with lots of alpha helices wrapping around DNA, and the DNA goes down the middle here, and each of these stacks on top of each other to make this helical structure. What's interesting about this particular one, so the Acidionis filamentous viruses versus the Sulfolobus Atlanticus rod-shaped virus, the overall structure here is very similar. 
terms of this you know, dimeric structure looping around the DNA in the middle. But here, your alpha helices have been moved. So we've got purple and green, and these green and purple are really overlapping with each other, actually kind of forming coiled coils with each other. Whereas in this Ascidianus filamentous virus, one of these helices says, hey, I don't want to mess with my neighbor here. I'm just going to fold back on top of myself. These sequences really don't look like each other in terms of their primary amino acid sequence, but have almost identical structures relative to each other. Um, and again, our packaging DNA through the middle here. Unfortunately, this structure is not quite high enough resolution to say if it's A-form DNA or not, but it probably is A-form DNA that's being packaged in this structure as well. So this, again, apart from the actual structure of the major capsid protein, very similar between the Sulfolobus islandicus rod-shaped virus and the Sudianus filamentous virus, except that these guys have lipids around the outside. And one of the fascinating things about these lipids, if you just look at the lipids, and I mentioned this right at the beginning, um, we've got many cases tetraether lipids present in archaea, and these are specific to archaea. If you look at how big these are, if you just stretch out one of these lipids, it's actually too long. Normally, one of these lipids from end to end, the lipid would be from this end of this arrow all the way to the end of that arrow. But it's a really skinny lipid layer on the outside. And they did some molecular dynamics studies where basically they just do lots of calculations in terms of where each of the atoms should be in your molecule. And they came up with this really, I think, bizarre looking structure, which matches now what they have in terms of the width of this membrane, the envelope on the outside of this virus. It's a bent lipid, just this horseshoe-like lipid. So here's a charge group at one end, here's a charge group at the other end, and it's basically sort of you know, horseshoe-like lipid. And so you end up with half of the width of the lipid here as the envelope. This is still a prediction. We don't have a high enough resolution structure to say anything about it, but this is a thought on how you could actually get these very narrow structures here. And those of you who are in the mutant viruses from hell class, you know that SSVs also have lipids associated with their proteins on the outside. Maybe you have this same kind of folded over lipid structure that you find in these virus particles. Again, open question in terms of how these are there or not. So I mentioned the fullerene cone model, again, that looks like HIV for SSV1 structure. Maybe the end cones like APV. But then another structure has come out with this, and I like to call this the candy cane structure um, for these kinds of viruses. This is a singly tailed virus that infects Acidianus, which is very similar to SSV. And this is an idea on how some of these tails might have formed. And so they think here that these are actually multiple helical structures that are all stacked on top of each other and then become a larger helical structure and then getting to be a smaller helical structure at the end. This is not very high resolution structure of the actual virion. This is the virion up here at the top. But they do have high resolution structures for the capsid proteins. And these capsid proteins are all alpha helical. And so that's also, you know, we talked about the STIV structure before, some of the really well conserved double beta barrel structures for forming virus particles. Here, not so much. Pretty much all alpha helices. Many, many, many different alpha helices. Okay, one more clicker question so we can get a 100%. Yes, okay. And then I'll talk about the VAPs. So, <clears throat> which of the following viruses has a bottle-like virion morphology? ATV, ABV, SIRV, SSV1, STIV. Start. Alphabet soup. Unfortunately, there's a lot of the alphabet soup. And I'll try not to have too much of it on the final, but there'll be some. <clears throat> 
Three of you still haven't voted. <laughs> oh, just one. Five, three, two, one. Stop. What do we think? A Cydianus bottle shaped virus, ABV, bottle shaped morphology. Okay, so finish up. <clears throat> Wanted to talk about STIV. We already talked about STIV, sulfur-loaded icosahedral virus. Again, one of my favorites because I discovered it. In terms of the overall structure, which is nice icosahedrally symmetric with these you know, five-fold axis of symmetry right here, T equals 31 because the hexameric structures here have these double beta barrel structures. Again, unlike the alpha helices we were talking about before. But didn't want to talk about the structure here. I wanted to talk about one thing that the group that I was working on um, which discovered after I left the lab there, this is Mark Young's group at Montana State University, is they were looking at sulfolobus that was infected by these particles and they saw these really weird pyramidic-like projections coming off of an infected cell. So these are normal cells over here, SEM and TEM. These are infected cells with these pyramids. And down here, this is a TEM with the SEM. And then after the viruses, of virions, as you say, are released, you end up with these holes in the surface of the cell. And they're blasted apart right here. This was what was seen with STIV but basically almost simultaneously SIRV, these long rod-shaped viruses, they see exactly the same thing happening with these cells. And we've done some electron tomography where you can look now in more detail at each of these pyramids, as they call them, virion-associated pyramids. Here's the virion underneath one of these pyramid structures, which is really amazing in terms of its symmetry here. And then that opens, and it's got a seven-fold symmetry to it, which is also one of the very strange examples. Very few cases in biology do you have anything with a seven-fold symmetry. Six you see all the time, five you see all the time, three you see all the time. Seven is very bizarre. And it turns out if you just take the protein, which we now know what does this, and put it into E. coli, they will make pyramids like this, even though E. coli has nothing to do with sulfolobus or any of the viruses that are associated with it. The pyramids won't open in E. coli. You can also put this gene into Saccharomyces cerevisiae, into yeast, and they also will make these pyramids. So a brand new way of virions getting outside of cells through some of these archaeal viruses. And I love this image. This is a <clears throat> reconstructed false colored tomogram of a single poor sulfolobus cell producing SIRVs through all of these pyramids, um, which have made holes, and then each of these particles can end up being released um, through those holes. One question that people talk about, we talked about this way, way back at the beginning, wanted to come full circle here. Where do viruses come from? This is work from David Prangishvili and Patrick Fortier. Um, they think that there was a ancient virus sphere around our last universal common ancestor. And then the viruses have evolved together with their hosts. So bacterial viruses and bacterial hosts, archaeal viruses together with archaeal hosts, and eukaryotic viruses together with eukaryotic hosts. But all of them develop from this ancient virus sphere. And we may talk about the giant viruses um, a little bit later on. This is just what I've talked about for the last 65 minutes. Don't need to get into this in any more detail. And I just wanted to tell you, oh, sorry, show you a quick picture of the guy who's really been responsible for all of those new viruses, um, David Prangishvili, who sat right next to me during my postdoc um, in the Zillig lab in the late 1990s and has continued to do this work both in Regensburg and at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. We'll talk about HIV on Friday. <laughs>